Walk into any high school today and you will find a ghost town. There are bodies, but few living voices. Teenagers sit in circles, silently, heads bowed, eyes glued to cell phone screens, each connected to their own virtual reality, but disconnected from one another. Sometimes I feel like I could scream and nobody would look up. It's 2 p.m. on a Friday afternoon. I'm listening to senior high school students debate. The topic, technology. The question, is it ultimately beneficial or harmful for humanity? They argue the positives first. 3D printed bones, drones, self-driving cars, potential trips to Mars, gene editing, online shopping, the list goes on and on and unanimously they agree technology is amazing. But then a cell phone rings and like dominoes, every hand reaches for a phone. But what about this? An eager student points out the obvious distraction. And one by one, they begin to confess they see the flaws in the system. Sarah, who's a top English student, admits she refuses to take vacations with her family if there's no Wi-Fi, because her Snapchat streaks will be broken and her friendships broken too. Peter, an exchange student, says he gets panic attacks when his girlfriend takes too long to text message him back. Zach says he gets the sweats and reaches for the closest outlet when his phone is on 10% battery. Lily, Lily says she feels ashamed when a photo she posts on Instagram doesn't get enough likes. Now I understand these problems may seem trivial, but when you look close enough, you'll notice they are anything but superficial. Because they also tell me about the anxiety medication, the antidepressants, the insomnia, the loneliness, the stress, and I've come to know that a high school is nothing more but a microcosm of society, which means these problems plague all of us. And what's becoming increasingly concerning for me recently is realizing I am not immune to it. That I am Sarah, Peter, Zach, and Lily. My hand reaches for my phone more often than I am proud to admit. Sometimes I check out of conversations just to check my email for the 30th time that day. I break eye contact, exit the moment just to enter another reality that is constantly beckoning me to be a part of it. And the truth is, I am terrified. Terrified that this seemingly harmless affliction is quickly turning into an addiction. Now, I don't mean to demonize technology. Undoubtedly, it has and will solve many of our greatest problems. The problem is not technology, but rather our inability to keep our hands off it. To stop from mindlessly scrolling, double tapping, swiping, retweeting, subscribing, updating, scrolling, double tapping, swiping, scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. It is our inability to regulate and to moderate our use of it that is causing all this suffering and make no mistake of it. It is a substance that is savory and sweet, causes salivating and too much dopamine release, and we are misusing and abusing it without taking the time to pause and reflect. Pause, let me reflect. I first started teaching spoken word poetry because I wanted to make poetry cool again or maybe cool for the first time ever. It was my mission, one classroom at a time, to turn the entire world into spoken word poets. I thought it was a noble pursuit, 
until I realized teenagers feel about poetry the way they do about broccoli and homework. And I soon came to realize that what people need more than anything are meaningful human relationships. And that human connection, like any muscle, will atrophy if we do not exercise it regularly. So I started teaching spoken word poetry as a method of intervention to technology. I now offer it as a tool to help people communicate authentically, express themselves emotionally, to listen and to witness each other's stories. And whenever new poets take to the stage, I am reminded there is magic that exists in the energy exchange between you and me. Wouldn't you agree there is something special about this, about gathering in spaces like this that traces back to time immemorial, when storyteller and community used to gather in the dark around fire that reflected gold on our faces, and the stars eavesdropped on our conversations, and the moon smiled, and the wind tucked itself into the arms of trees, and grasshoppers sang lullabies, and the night was still, and the world outside disappeared, and nothing mattered. Nothing mattered. Nothing matters except this moment, right here. And when Storyteller began to speak, words wove themselves like spider webs between us, creating irreversible bonds of empathy and understanding. Like tree roots, our bodies speak in a complex language so beautiful, so mysterious, I dare call it universal poetry. And it seems to me there is still some trace of something primal, still some crumb of something ancient, something sacred about gathering in spaces like this to witness and to listen to each other in the flesh and herein lies the power of the spoken word. Now this isn't just my own whimsical opinion. I believe that a certain philosopher would agree with me. More than 2,000 years ago, Socrates believed in the power of the spoken word. So much so, he never wrote down a single word. Believed language was living only when it was spoken. That as soon as it was written down, it became mute, lifeless. In today's age where most of our communication takes place written on a screen, it means our interactions lack life force and vitality which is ultimately why I think we find it so dissatisfying. I don't know what a world of less empathetic, less connected, and voiceless people might be like. All I know is when I walk through hallways in high schools and I see teenagers sit silently in circles, I get a glimpse of what such a world might look like. Human connection, like any muscle, will atrophy if we do not exercise it regularly. It seems we must practice being human or else risk losing our humanity. And with that, I leave you with a poem and I thank you for listening. His name is James. He is 16, and I know his darkness. He's the boy in the back of the high school classroom who hides behind screens. His social anxiety, like many of his peers, steers his life into loneliness. I know the voice that haunts him. It is hungry and it scratches, knows what to say to keep him in bed, convinces him no one will notice if he doesn't show up. I don't have much, but I give them what I can. Pen, paper, and a chance to write a poem. Express your mess, I say. They tilt their heads to the sky as if an idea might drop from the ceiling, so instead I say, it's okay, just, just write what you're feeling. 
Only then do their pens begin to stain the page. Two hours later, I dare them to share. Somewhere in the back of a high school classroom, a boy who hides behind screens stirs. Inside him, a voice yearns to be heard. With trepidation, James raises his hand. I point, he stands, timid as a house who heard rumors of a hurricane. Trembling like a candle running out of wax, but he stands walks to the front of the room like it might be the only brave thing he'll ever do. The class holds their breath, afraid if they exhale he might be blown away and never come back. But then he looks up, and his eyes, his eyes ignite like fireflies, like stars, like flashlights, like lightning, like phosphorescence, like every beautiful thing that has ever devastated darkness. And when he begins to speak, the words escape his mouth like a river rushing to meet the ocean after years of meandering through deserts, like he is finally coming home. Fear unclenches its grip from his lungs. He breathes and lets go of his anxiety. He is reversing origami, learning to come undone slowly opening himself up without hurrying, untucking his creases, unfurling his nuances. This is poetry in the making. His body softens. His hands open. This is the first time the boy learns he is not made of stone. He is not a robot, not drone, not holding place for a phone. He is hot flesh, blood, and bone. His poem, it may be small, but it is his, and it comes from the most honest of places. When he finishes, the class applauds like waves crashing onto a shore, glad to have landed in that moment with him. A smile stretches so far across his face, I doubt he'll come back from it the same. And for a moment, I see the world as it could be. Empathetic, connected, listening. I know James is not cured, but this I know for sure. One true quality moment of connection transcends a thousand text messages. And for a boy who hides behind screens to allow himself to be seen, to expose his heart, to denounce the dark, and above it all, to call it art, is the reason I so desperately believe in the power of the spoken word. It may not save the world, but we are bleeding for belonging. And this, this, this is the closest I have come to a remedy for human suffering. Thank you.